The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up, knelt down before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answered him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and your mother. He replied and said to him, Teacher, all of these I have observed from my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You are lacking in one thing. Go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. At that statement, his face fell. And he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. So Jesus again said to them in reply, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for one who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were exceedingly astonished and said among themselves, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For human beings it is impossible, but not for God. All things are possible for God. Peter began to say to him, We have given up everything and followed you. Jesus said, Amen, I say to you. There is no one who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the sake of the gospel who will not receive a hundred times more now in this present age houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and eternal life in the age to come. The Gospel of the Lord. We're very happy to have with us today Gary Teal. Gary was the former principal of St. Anthony's School in Renton. And six years ago, he and his wife, Anne, went to uh, Guatemala, to Antigua, the ancient capital there. And there they decided to serve the poor in a very special way. And so he's going to share some of that with us. And um, uh, I'd I'd like to uh, introduce him and have him come forward now. Thank you, Father Jim, and good evening to everyone, and especially to these beautiful families who are bringing their children into the church this evening. It's, it's wonderful to see your faces and the joy uh, that you're sharing with us this evening. It's also my pleasure to be, with your, be here with you this evening. Um, I travel to the United States once a year to share our story and to share communion with my cradle, the Catholic Church. Before I share my personal story, I'd like to take a little bit of time to explore the scripture because the the readings this evening have personal and special meaning for me. The first, from wisdom, scripture says that I prayed, I pleaded for prudence. Now, a lot of times in the modern meaning of prudence, we think that means we're asking for us to be cautious, to not take risks, to be safe. But in fact, at the time that the scriptures were written, prudence meant the ability to choose between what was virtuous and what was hurtful and to act accordingly. So the scripture writing writer is pleading for the ability to have wisdom, to know what is the right thing to do, to separate good from evil. 
Scripture also goes on to compare wisdom and prudence with two very earthy materials. Sand, it says gold is but like sand. Now we know what sand is like. It flows through our fingers easily. It blows away in the wind. It's certainly not something that we would want to build the foundation of our house upon. And it also, if you've ever walked through a desert, is very difficult to travel in. Secondly, Scripture says silver is like mire. And the word mire means a deep, dismal, swampy bog. Again, a type of earth that is very difficult to travel through. It entraps us. It engulfs us. It keeps us from moving on our journey. The second reading from Hebrews is one of those really scary readings from Scripture, from my perspective. It likens Scripture to a sword, something that's going to cut you open to the very marrow. It's going to reveal to you who you are, and it's going to call you to render an account. Now, I used to be an accountant, and I know what to render an account means. It means to justify how you have spent your resources. It's like going before your boss and and having to justify that steak and three martini dinner. How can you justify that expense? And it's preparing us for the gospel reading. Again, one of the most powerful for me and for others, a gospel passage. Because in it, Jesus is preparing for a journey, not just any journey. He's not going to visit his grandmother or uh, his uh, nieces and nephews. He is preparing to travel to Jerusalem. He is preparing to celebrate Passover. That celebration of moving from bondage and slavery to liberation. And he is also journeying to Calvary to the ultimate sacrifice. And as he is preparing for this, a young man runs up to him and throws himself at Jesus' feet. This isn't a Pharisee who is trying to trick Jesus. This is a sincere seeker of truth. And he asks Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to enter into an enduring relationship with God? What must I do to enter the kingdom of heaven? So the first set of questions that Jesus asks him is, have you been good to your neighbor? The second half of the Decalogue. Have you uh, been respectful of your neighbor's wife? Have you not slept with her? Have you not stolen from your neighbors? Have you not lied to your neighbors? Have you treated your mother and father with honor? And to this the young man responds, yes, I have. I have done all of those things. I have been a good person. And then Jesus, in a very loving way, for again, this young man was not trying to trick Jesus. He was sincerely seeking the truth. And Jesus said to him, there is but one thing left you need to do. Go. Sell your goods. Give to the poor. And then, come, follow me. Each of us can hear that gospel passage and respond in a variety of ways. St. Francis of Assisi heard that passage, read that passage, listened to that passage, tore off his clothes, ran through the streets of Assisi, and hugged lepers. And everyone in his community thought he was stark, raving mad. Others of us, we take a more measured approach. We tend to rationalize. We say, well, you know, I'm really not that rich. Or, Jesus was just speaking in Aramaic hyperbole. He, he really didn't mean it. He was just trying to make a point. 
And yet others of us will be like the young man, and we will turn away, and we will ignore what Jesus has asked us to do. Some of you here may remember me as principal of St. Anthony's. I know that there are some in the audience who still have children who attend St. Anthony's. And you would know that probably on a daily basis, I would share with students, teachers, parents, parishioners, the mission of St. Anthony School, which was to educate children to be joyous, loving, Christ-centered people capable of serving others and bettering the world. And that mission statement, I said it every day for six years, and eventually it seeped into my bones, it along with this passage from the Gospels. And I finally said, it is time for me not to just talk the talk, but to walk the walk. My wife and I decided that we would take a year off and seek out some way to work with the poor in a third world country. By happenstance, we ended up working in the Guatemala City garbage dump, where we helped children gain access to education and also comforted those who had suffered physical and sexual abuse. We stayed with that project for a year and a half. And originally, our intent had been to return to Seattle, resume our careers in education. My wife is a teacher as well. But guess what? God is a God of surprises. Instead of returning to Seattle, we fell in love. We fell in love with Guatemala. We fell in love with its peoples. And strangely enough, we fell in love with its history and its poverty. Working with our Guatemalan guide and mentor, Gustavo Valle, we established a foundation to help improve the quality of and access to education in rural, poverty-impacted indigenous villages in Guatemala. In the five years that our foundation has existed, we have raised over $300,000 and distributed that to schools, to students, in the form of grants. Those grants can be anything from purchasing school supplies, teaching materials, uh, classrooms, bathrooms, breakfast programs. Our approach is not to impose upon the communities that we work with any particular solution. Rather, we consult with the teachers, we consult with the community leaders, and we ask them, what is the next step that you see to improve education for the children in your village? In fact, we were cited in a recent study of 44 NGOs, non-governmental organizations in Guatemala working in education, as being the only organization that truly collaborated with the public ministry of education and collaborated at a very local level with the teachers. Now, why education? We're teachers. Naturally, we were drawn to that. But we also know that educate Guatemala is a country like I said, a poverty and a history of oppression. 500 years of an oppression, exploitation, and discrimination against its indigenous peoples. In the villages where we work, over 75% of the families are in ex basic or extreme poverty. Extreme poverty being simply not even having enough resources to purchase the minimum daily caloric requirements. Poverty being simply defined as having enough to buy basic food, but not enough for health care, education, or housing. 65% of the, of the people in the villages where we work are illiterate. And over 80% of the children suffer from chronic malnutrition and illness. So we picked education because we know it does several things. 
One, it brings about greater social equality. We're trying to combat those 500 years of oppression and discrimination. Two, it provides families with greater economic capacity. For every year, a person in a Guatemalan family goes to school beyond sixth grade, the family's economic capacity increases by 10%. This is a huge advantage for them. Most children in the villages where we work complete second grade only and then drop out to work in the, villa in the fields. We're trying to keep children in school. In addition, we know that education helps reduce infant mortality and maternal mortality. It also decreases domestic violence in the home. It's also not charity. It's justice. There's the story of the villager who one day goes down to the river and he sees a baby floating in the water and he swims out and saves the baby. He then tells his other villagers, there, there was a baby in the river. So the next morning, more villagers go out and they see more babies floating down the river and they swim out and they save those babies. And each day that continues to happen over and over and over again. Until one day, the villagers are going out to the river and the original villager takes a different path. And the other villagers say, where are you going? We have babies to save. And he said, I'm going up river to see who keeps throwing the babies in the river. That's the difference between charity and justice. Yes, we need charity and compassion. We need to save the babies from the river. But we also need to address the social systems that create the problems in the first place. That's one of the reasons why we have chosen education as the focus of our foundation. This evening, I will be speaking after mass, meeting with anyone who has any further questions about what we do. We also have a table out in the narthex which has Guatemala craft items for sale. All the proceeds from that go to help fund our foundation. And Father Jim has also shared with me that next week is the Mission Sunday collection. And he has arranged for whatever amount exceeds your donations last year for Mission Sunday will go to our foundation to help improve education for the children of Guatemala. Before I conclude, I want to share with you a quote from Pauline Marie Jaracot. Now, I never knew, knew about her, but she was a young woman from France who, at the age of 15, became very aware of the need for missions. And she founded the Society for the Propagation of the Faith, which has become the basis for many of the church's modern missionary activities. But she said this, our love should pour forth into the community, extending beyond ourselves to those faraway places where nobody is watching, where the vulnerable have been forgotten and the poor abandoned. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Gary. As he mentioned, as Gary mentioned, I have talked with J.L. Druard, the uh, head of the missions office for our archdiocese, and uh, explained the situation regarding uh, that I would love to have some money uh, go towards his foundation. I, again, I recommended that anything over and above uh, last year's uh, collection do uh, go there. And I think it was about, I think we, uh, 
collected about $5,000, which was a great deal of money for last year. So uh, again, um, I'd ask you to think about perhaps uh, being a little bit more generous uh, this, this year. If you're giving through Faith Direct, you may want to um, go ahead and go beyond what you've uh, uh, asked them to take out of your electronic funds. And, um, and you can make out a check uh, for, um, to St. John the Baptist Church. Again, just put Mission Sunday on that. I, I just um, I was going to say this at the very end, but I might as well now, now that I'm talking about it, there, there is an envelope in your monthly packet for the World Mission Sunday. And again, that goes to help uh, missions throughout the world. And uh, also, um, there should be one nearby you on a chair if you'd like to bring that home with you as well. Again, that collection will be taken up next weekend uh, after uh, communion uh, as a second collection. And thank you for your generosity.